I can today take up the plaintive lament of a peeled and woe-smitten people by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains heavy and grievous yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow, May my right hand forget her cunning. And may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to lightly pass over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on the 4th of July. Amen. 
Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis that I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate I will not excuse. All right. All right. All right. I shall use the severest language that I can command. Yes, and yet, not one word shall escape me. That any man whose heart is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right Amen. and just. Bless Father Frederick Douglass's heart. We are not anti-American. We love America. This is our home for many of us. Yet we are anti-injustice in America. It is amazing that a former slave would stand before a largely so-called white audience and say the words that were just said right. in their hearing right. with boldness. Yes, and I am of the staunch opinion that his boldness deserves at least an equal view yes, in this time, yes, that we can understand the burden of what he was trying to say in fullness. Please turn to the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 17. The book is called The Acts of the Apostles because it documents the actions of God's reconciliatory ministry of early Christianity and beyond. Yes, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 17, verse number 24. God, that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And 
hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We are his offspring. It is God, we are told by Luke, who has written the Acts of the Apostles, that gives to all life and breath and all things, the Apostle Paul was speaking here. It is God that made of one blood all nations. Of one blood all nations. Of one man's blood all nations when God created man in the beginning he did not create a billion men he made one man and inside of that one man lived all men bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh in this regard, none of us, whatever our background or ethnicity, can dare stand in the face of any other person and say anything other than, you are bone of my bone, and you are flesh of my very flesh. You are in truth my Brother, every breath that we take is an infallible proof that we are but one human family breathing the same air, living in the same world, existing and moving and having our being in the very God whose offspring we are. We exist in the world, breathing the same air, being incapable of any existence without each other. We are distinct. We have differences, yet we are not separate. We are individuals, yet we are not individualistic. We are independent in ourselves, yet dependent on each other and existing interdependently. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We are all tied in one single garment of destiny 
what affects one directly affects all indirectly. Racism is an intentional misnomer. It is a cunningly devised fable that exists only within the confines of sectism. The proper term is actually not racism at all. For we are all one human race. And to employ the term racism gives the idea that we are different races. In us and every child of God, there is nothing inside of their spirit that receives the idea that we are different races. More than not receiving it, there is something which repels and rebels against the very idea that we are different races. And so the proper term is sectism or divisions among mankind. And within sectism is the socially constructed, fabricated idea of racism. What we must realize is that since this is true, we are compelled to, I say we are compelled, as the human family, to staunchly, to staunchly refuse to be divided at any time, for any reason, whatsoever. We must refuse to bite and devour each other as if we were not the offspring of the one true and only God. We should refuse to believe that we ultimately have different burdens, that we ultimately have different burdens. Because among the family of humanity, there is a constancy of need and desire that is the same for every human being. We must reject the idea the socially constructed idea that we ultimately want different things. I speak to the world at large, but if this is going to happen in the world, it must begin with the people of God, the church of God, it must begin with us. I speak now only to those of us in this room and that are part of the Church of God in which God is restoring and has been restoring. I now speak only to us. We must show what it means to a world what it means to actually believe that we are all one blood. Because it is a wonderful concept. But the world needs to see what it looks like when people actually believe that they are one blood. I'm not talking to the world, I'm talking to us. We must show that we believe it. 
It begins with us. It has began with us. It did not just start with us, but we are in a situation. We're in a bit of a conundrum. There was a cry, and I still speak to the church of God, to us. There was a cry in the early 1950s and 1960s in the human rights movement, which has falsely been labeled and known as the civil rights movement. But it was a human rights movement with the mantra, with the uh, slogan of I am a man. We're fighting for human rights. And there were those that are called our white brothers. I say white for our identification because of the system of the world, and we all understand what I'm saying. There were our white brothers that marched with those like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that lived, that worked, that labored, and even bled and died alongside their brothers of quote unquote color. And I greatly respect and admire the work that was done and honor those that did it. I believe God was with them and God is always with the oppressed. Yet there's something more that we must add. We can't just live in that time. There's some progression that needs to take place, and I'm still speaking to us because the world cannot, the world at large cannot gather this progression that needs to happen without our latching a hold of this progression that needs to happen. In the human rights movement, known as the civil rights movement, the white people would say with a good heart, you cannot keep doing this to them. You cannot do this to them. The black people have been treated unjustly and I will not stand for what you are doing to them. And I appreciate it and I honor those I honor them there in my heart. I honor their sacrifice. Many of them, as I said already, lived, bled, and died. But the further progression and the better understanding that their death and blood and labors call for is that we no longer say what was done to black people. You can't do that to poor them. Today, we have reached the pinnacle where we say, you can no longer do this to us. There is a problem of an inordinate amount of African American males and women in the prison industrial system. It is not just poor black people's problem. But there need to be some quote, end quote, white people that demand that you release us. Because you cannot oppress one of us and not deeply affect and oppress all of us because we are one blood, one people, one family bone of each other's bone, flesh of each other's flesh. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. Here, we must refuse to accept segregation. Not just the lunch counters, which I so gratefully admire. Not just being beaten. But we must refuse to accept being a part. I still speak to us, the Church of God here, us specifically. We must refuse to be a part, not just from the world. Yes, 
but from each other here specifically. Amen. You would say, brother, I am doing that. And we are. But the last time I checked, we are in a restoration. And we have farther to go. We must not think of our differences as division. We must refuse to think of our differences as division. For just as I am not divided from the brother who is six foot seven, and I don't happen to be six foot seven, neither am I divided from the brother that has any other difference whatsoever in the human family. The differences are not division. They are the beauties of the blossom of the differences of humanity that merge together in the beauties of God's nature in whom we live and move and have our being. We must not accept the thought, the narrative, the thing that is in the air that suggests because you're different than me, you are a division maker. No, we are not division makers. God took care of that when he washed us in, in the blood of Jesus and sanctified us holy. And so we must rebel yes, sir. against the system. We must determine, please be seated, I have something to tell you. We must determine to refuse oppression. Refuse oppression and allow expression. All right. That's good, brother. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. And not think of expression as oppression. Neither ought we try to make every bird sound like a blue jay. It is an expression of their culture, which is allowed. And it also accentuates every other culture and makes all of us look absolutely wonderful for allowing such a thing to exist in purity and holiness without division and malice and confusion and chaos and riot. I said it. I said that. Do not, think, do not think that what I said is just divisional. Remember my preceding statements and remember my preceding decades. It is not divisional. We are not divisive. We're the church of God where everybody's going to come in the world that wants to be saved. And if somebody comes, not even of that background, and sees a people dwelling together in unity, not biting, not devouring, they might actually think that there's room for them to come and express themselves in the love of God. They might actually believe that. We have the best fashion. It is not of the world, it is ours. We have the best hairstyles. They are not of the world, they are ours. We have the best children. They are not of the world, they are ours. We have the most beautiful women. We have the most handsome men. Because of what is flowing inside. But the world need not fear because that handsomeness that we have, everyone else can have a little bit too because we only one blood. Have a seat, I have something to tell you. The scripture says, He hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So now today we must reject sectism. We must refuse it. Now I speak outside of this place to other Church of God groups. I'm no longer talking to us in here. I already did that. 
Now I'm talking to other Church of God groups in Chicago, in Mississippi, in Tennessee. I'm talking to them in West Middlesex, not abusively because we are all brethren. I'm speaking to them saying, now we have to do better. We have to refuse sectism. Amen. We cannot continue to be in various church of God groups. I'm not attacking you. I'm pleading with you as bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. We cannot live in this world in this time as separate factions of so-called church of God. Certainly there are some things we would have to work through. We would have to work through the musical instrument idea. Yes, We'd have to work through the dress standard. Yes. We'd have to work through divorce and remarriage. What does all that mean? We'd have to work through the time of the silence, the woman in the wilderness. We'd even have to work through if in fact I come or we're together, will I be able to preach? Which is a major question. All right. We'd have to work through all of that I'm not going to address that from behind the pulpit in detail. Yes, I'm only going to say that the option to address it is not there. We must address it because we must be together. Am I attacking you? Do not believe it. Do not subscribe to the narrative that says, I am now bashing Church of God groups because to be quite frank, we kind of need you here. How can you say we need somebody else? Because they're bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. And what affects them directly affects us indirectly. The world needs to see people that believe in Church of God doctrine being able to actually dwell together. And whether you're in Springfield, Ohio, or whether you're in Chicago, one of the many factions, or whether you remember Emerson Wilson, or whether you remember whatever you remember, the time is past for us to be apart. We're going to have to deal with one another. It's easily done if the leaders are not racists. And we live in a time now that if, I tell you, my brother, as bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh, we live in a time now that if you will not be willing to sit and talk and work out things with your brother, you will no longer be a brother. You will be something else. It's not for the people. How are you going to get all these people together? Minister and brother, it's not for the people to figure out what to do. It's for you to not be racist and give us a call. We'll call you. We'll come anywhere. We need you. We can work out any problem at any time. But we have to be together. Say, you just want people to come to you. Well, yes, yes, of course. Of course we want people to come to us. But we'd be willing to come to you, but you're not preaching this message. So apparently the people that are producing this are the rally, is the rallying point. They're the people that you rally with. But it's not we have to come to your group. Bless your heart. Amen, Bless your heart. Amen. You don't have to come to our group. You are us. We are you. Because God only made of one blood all nations. And if you're washed in the blood of Jesus, you already are us. And it is a denial of the power and the working of God's blood to allow yourself to remain apart. And now I speak. Have a seat, please. Now I speak. 
In closing to the church of God people, you have no permission to be divided. As a preacher, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, standing with my fellow brethren, we have no permission from God, our Father, to be divided. We're not allowed. We got to be good boys and girls. We're not allowed. And now I speak to the world generally. I speak to the Democrats. I speak to the Republicans. I speak to the left wing and the right wing and the center and the far center regions of the universe. Actually, we all want the same thing, ultimately. Ultimately, we all would say we want peace in America. Ultimately, we would all say we want it to work. Ultimately, we would all say we want peace and justice. We have to refuse to allow labels of Democrat, Republican, etc to divide us. How do we do that? You have to not stand on the democratic platform, not stand on the Republican platform. You are not a conservative. That's actually made up nonsense. If you allow me, it's a bit humorous to me if it wasn't so sorrowful that conservatives often don't even believe that there is a system that is calling them conservative. They don't believe in an oppressive system and the system they don't believe in has labeled them as conservatives and they stand on what the system says they should be while saying the system doesn't exist. And therefore, we have to refuse to be Democrats. That is not our platform. I say to the world, Republicans not our platform. Conservative is not our platform. There actually is no such thing. What is our platform? I'm glad you asked. Our platform is humanity. We're one blood. And anything that violates that and causes a division between fellow humans of any ethnicity is of the devil and of the false system. We must refuse. I'm talking to the world now. I'm not talking to church folk only. I mean, I'm not talking to church of God folk. I, I am talking to church folk. We must refuse to be divided when we need food, clothing, shelter, love, and peace, and affection. When we have loved ones and family, and we care, and we need to live, and we need to clothe ourselves, we need to stand on that platform and come together with that understanding and let everything else crumble by the way. As long as we stand in the platform of Republican, we will be divided from everybody that's a Democrat. As long as we stand on the, on the platform that's Democrat, we'll be divided from everybody else that's Republican. As long as you believe that black people are the only ones that have ever been abused, it will divide you from everybody else that's been abused. As long as you believe white people are better, it's going to divide you from the brother that you need. I'm calling to the white supremacists. Do not believe that I am less than you. Don't subscribe to a system that makes you believe I'm less than you. I'm a man. You're a man or a woman. Do not believe what this system has said to you. I don't hate you. It's a lie made up by a disgusting system. I'm not talking about the people of this land. I'm talking about the system that has terrorized our minds. I talk to the LGBTQ community. We must reject the narrative that says that just because we believe in a quote, end quote, traditional marriage lifestyle. And we do not believe in a non-traditional lifestyle that that means then that we hate you, our brother or our sister. Don't believe, I'm talking to the LGBT community. Don't believe that. We love you. 
Don't you believe that we don't love you? There are a lot of people in the world hurting. There are a lot of people being abused and oppressed. And we do not hate the LGBTQ community. We refuse to accept that narrative. We love the LGBTQ community. They are one with us. Breathing the same air, living, moving, having their being in the same God that we serve. And we cannot find it within ourselves to hate you. Do not believe the narrative that says our belief is hate speech. Stand up with us on the basis of humanity. It's not true. We have all been oppressed, and the cry of the oppressed was found in our opening scripture. It was the Hebrews crying for relief from Babylonian captivity. But yet, in that cry, there is a capture of all oppression that was before and a cry of all oppression that was going to be in the world since. And the cry is for a city where these things do not happen. The cry was for a city where the wicked power structure does not abuse and oppress us. A city of love. It was a cry for the city where no oppression lives, where peace, brotherhood, and love reign. It was a cry for Jerusalem, the city of love. Now have a seat, and the title of our message is The City of Love. In the book of Psalm chapter 48, it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, is beautiful for situation, the joy, the joy, the joy not just of the Hebrews, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. There is a city where no oppression lives, where people are allowed to live holy and pure and express themselves. There's a city without the system that has fabricated narratives and divisive, hate-filled mongerings. There's a city that will not make you wear a mask to divide you. And the mask that is being worn is not just the piece of cloth that we've experienced recently, but very often there's a mask on the people for lack of identification or lack of ability to express who they really are and trying to conform to something else, which is the essence of oppression. There's a city where you get to take your mask off and where you can dwell together. There's a city where no barriers can stand in our way. There's a city where love flows from heart to heart. There's a city where oppression never enters and where love and peace abound. There is a city where all the citizens are of one heart and one soul of whatever ever ethnicity. There is a city where our differences like the beauty of the flowers, only bring forth the sweet-smelling savor of the unity of nature and the blessing of God's creation. Amen. There is a city, Isaiah chapter 65. I would say I'm almost done if it were true. Isaiah 65, chapter 65. 
Saturday night, I used to could dance all night long. And now I can preach all night long. In a city that's better than New York City. I've been to Times Square. I've been to Chicago. I actually like the city, but there's no city like unto this city. The city that never sleeps and the city whose founder never slumbers. Isaiah chapter 65. Bear with us, I'll try to move. Isaiah 65, verse 17. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. We used to be racists. We used to be prejudiced. We used to be divisive. We used to be troublemakers. We used to only want to be around our own kind until the blood of Jesus and the God of heaven helped us to know that all humanity is our kind. Verse 18. Be, it says, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jeru, Salem. A rejoicing. And her people. Her people are just a joy. A city of joyful people, not a section of town, not a segmented, fragmented, fractured, divisional community that has gates and bars to keep the bad people out and remain among your kind, but a city of joyful people. A city whose people are a joy and Jerusalem itself, the city, the entire city, is not having a rejoicing time. The city is a rejoicing. They're not having a good rejoicing time. They are a rejoicing. Is, is, uh, is that what verse 18 said? I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing. Notice how God had to recreate something because as father frederick douglas told us america has been false not talking about the beautiful people of this land not talking about the beautiful land itself not talking about the innocent people that we love talking about the system that has been abusive and divisive and has reaped chaos among all people the system is not failing the system is a great success. The system of the world is not failing. The system of the world is a great success. It's a success in making you think that you are different biologically than me. It is a success in causing riot and division and chaos and mayhem and all kinds of divisiveness among a family that God never intended to be divided. And so God said, I'm going to create a brand new place. And that place that I'm going to create will fulfill and answer the cry of every longing oppressed heart that says, if I forget Jerusalem. Now, the prophet Isaiah which is the gospel of Isaiah, the fifth gospel. Isaiah said that God told him that he's going to create Jerusalem. 
It's not as if there was not a Jerusalem there already. But the implication, the very direct statement is simply that the Jerusalem that was there, if I may say, was not good enough. And now, don't forget what I said earlier, we're one blood. We are not anti-Semitic. We are not abusive to our Jewish brothers. The system told you that. And you have the responsibility to accept the real narrative that we're all one human family. It's a bit difficult for some people that have been elevated in their minds to believe that everyone else is inferior to they. And I'm not only talking about what is known as Jewish people, white people. There are black superiority religions. There are black people that believe that black people should not marry white people. There are white people that believe that white people shouldn't marry black people. There are people that believe that they are mixed. And they are not mixed. A human can't be mixed. Mixed with what? And if you're mixed with humanity, that means you ain't mixed. You're not mixed. What is a mixed person? I'm mixed. I'm African American. I'm proud to be a black man. For real though, I am proud to be a black man. I'm, I'm just saying, I gotta say that. I, I mean, y'all don't, don't know what to say right now, but for real, I'm about to give y'all one of these. I'm a, I, I am proud. I'm proud to be a black man. I'm all the way, I'm talking about in this system, you know, Brother Andy just said there are no black people. Come with the burden and get the soul of what I'm saying. I'm proud to be a black man. I am not white. I don't walk white. I don't look white. I don't sound white. I don't want to be white. You stand up and say, all right then, all right then, well, I don't want to be black. But you can't say that in anger. You can't say that you're proud to be white just because I said I'm proud to be black. Well, if you're that and I'm this. No, 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 no. But can I say it? Yes. You can say it if you say it like me because I'm saying it with a squeaky clean heart. I mean squeaky clean. I'm, I'm saying it in a room full of pre predominantly white folks. And the world don't even believe that. Somebody listening here be like, these are not white folks in here that he's talking to. Are they listening to him? <laughs> Can you believe he said that? You should be proud of what you are. Yes. To be proud of what you are is not divisional. No. I, would, I would never advise you or accept from you okay. to be a German, so to speak. I'm, I'm saying German. There are Germans in the world. I've seen them. I would not accept from you to be a German and then wish that you could be black. It's a disgrace. Can I say something to my low German speaking brethren? Y'all need to have that language backward, forward, up and down and be very proud of your mom and your dad. Very proud. I'm talking about head raised high proud. You have a heritage of people that wanted to follow God and your parents brought you here. You should be head over heels in love with your parents. And happy, happy with who you are. You're not gonna make me upset. You're gonna make me upset if you're not. I'm gonna think something's wrong with you. Native American. You should be powing and wowing. <laughs> proud. I'm proud. I'm proud of who I am. They'll say, well, there were some pagan aspects. I ain't talking about the pagan part because we're already squeaky clean. I'm, I'm talking about the real ethnic part. Yes, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mexicans from Mexico. Got the nerve to have a border wall. Ain't nothing wrong with borders. Y'all lock y'all's doors, too. 
got the nerve to have a border wall and say you can't cross here. I'm going to build a wall. Well, you're getting political now. No, I ain't. You got to come out of politics. Do I have enough time? Do I have a little more time? They didn't say nothing over here. Until y'all say something, I'm not. Do I have a little bit more time over here this section? All right, good. I just want to make sure they're alive. See, I ain't going to let you. I'm, I'm from a culture where you got to say something to me when I'm preaching. Now, there are some that can just go ahead and go with it, and they just keep. But you got to, like, if I look up, I'll be like, hello. You say, you're not supposed to preach for amens. I'm not. But I am. It's not a show. I am preaching for an amen. I'm just not preaching for no amens. God bless you while your head spins on that one. <laughs> Mexicans from Mexico. We're going to set up a border wall. If I was a Mexican president, I'd say, yes, I support that border wall. All right, brother. I would. I, y- 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 y'all wait and see what I'm saying. I support that border wall. I support it. Just give me back California, New Mexico, and put, just, just give me right back, give me back all that stuff you saw. Just put that wall in the right place. Is that right, brother? Yeah. Just put that wall, just give me back my country that you stole from me. You thief, you're a thief. Say you're anti-American. I am not anti-American. I served in the military. You better back up off me. I'm a vet during wartime. And if you can't say that, shut your mouth. Don't tell, don't tell me that I hate America. It's not true. I don't receive the narrative. I don't believe the narrative. I love America. I love the American people and the people of the world. I just hate the injustice that is dividing us. Don't come at me like that. I carried guns for you. M203 grenade launcher. M16, 5.56, and 7.62. Mark 19, 9 millimeter M16. I carried guns for y'all to protect and serve. Better back up off me. (laughs) Trying to tell me I don't love America. You live in this land, freedom, and you have the right to disagree with me because I gave it to you and fought for it. Better back up off me talking about I'm anti-American. I don't believe it. Don't you believe that? I'm a a vet. Did I say I was a vet? (laughs) And I got some benefits that I never used. I might go back and get me some. (laughs) I'm trying. I'm trying. Give me some old benefits. All right. Say, oh, there it is. You just want a handout. All right. That's something else. Have a seat. I got something to tell you. So the scripture says, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing, and her people a joy. Are you a joy? Some of y'all, I got to be all the way real. Can I be all the way real? Some of y'all don't even look like you're a joy sometimes. I'm preaching like, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, her people a joy. And I encourage you to take off your mask. Take off your mask. Well, brother, if I was black like you, because you know black people, you know black people, they know how to dance and really, black people. If I was black like you, well, then I'd really get loose if there was a time. I, I mean, I'd be so loose because black people are so loose. And I don't have any soul or rhythm. That's a lie. That's a lie. White people got rhythm. White people have soul. White people can get excited. There's some, there's some oppressive situations that have been imposed upon people that are in this room. Well, the Ger- Germans, we Germans, German, but yeah, the German. We German, a business like we're Germans. I am German. (laughs) Say, don't mock the Germans. I'm not mocking the Germans. I'm mocking the system that has perpetrated such a disaster and imposed something on people that need not be imposed upon them. We're in a different city, and the city is a joy. 
It's a rejoicing. The people are a joy. Hebrews chapter 11. How much? What time is it? Time to preach. Hebrews, uh, I like you, Brother Bovers. I, I like you, Brother Bovers. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if you're still awake. What is Hebrews 11 commonly called? Hey, I was just checking to make sure everybody's still awake. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Verse number 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. They saw them afar off. They saw the promises afar off. They saw the city afar off, and they were persuaded that such a place existed. They were persuaded that God made such a place. So persuaded was Abraham that he was actually physically in the land that God actually physically promised and refused to build something because he was looking for something that God was going to build. He was looking for something God was going to create. He was looking for a city that was a rejoicing and a people that were a joy. I hope I'm not making you tired. They were persuaded of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly if they had been mind full of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better. That is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? For he hath prepared for them a city where oppression can never enter. Revelation chapter 21. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Revelation 21. You've been so kind to listen. Some of you have been kind to listen. Revelation 21 and 9. And there came unto me one of the chief apostles. Uh, I'm sorry. And there came unto me one of the. <laughs> I'm sorry. My mind just dipped on over into the realities of the text. And there came unto me the chief apostle. One of the seven angels which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me. Chief apostle talking to John, the apostle, connecting for us the prophecy, helping us to understand through prophetic vision that we are in the lineage that produces the city. Full of the seven last plagues, he talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Can I get everybody to hold up one finger? Hold up one finger. All right, thank you. Put that finger right there. All right. Now turn back to Hebrews. I just want you to hold your place there. That's all I'm doing. 
Turn back to Hebrews, please. Everybody wondering what I'm doing. And y'all just did it so obediently. Hold, didn't know what I was doing. Hold up your finger. Everybody like, amen. Put it right there. Amen. Told you the city was a rejoicing. Yeah. Hebrews. Chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Now, hold your place in Hebrews 12 and go back to Revelation chapter 21. Verse 10. But hold your place in Hebrews. And he, verse 10, Revelation 21, 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Please hold your place and turn to Hebrews 12 and 22. Hold your place. Hebrews 12 and 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. He carried me away to a great and high mountain. Paul said, ye are come unto Mount Zion. Hold your place there. Go back to Revelation chapter 21. Verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city. Hold your place. Go back to Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God. Hold your place right there and go back to Revelation 21. Verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. We got that. And showed me that great city. We got that. The holy Jerusalem. Guess what I'm going to say now? Hold your place there. Go back to Hebrews 12. 22, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, we're, we're just studying this all, yes, ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city, there's Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, and look what we have, look here, the heavenly Jerusalem, all right. Amen. and to an innumerable company of angels. Now go back to Revelation 21, thank you for putting your fingers there, you can release your fingers. And he carried me away, verse 10, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Could this be the city that Abraham was looking for when he refused to build a city with his own hands? Could this be the same city that Paul said that the church in their primitive Christianity had come to? Could this be the very same one? Hold up your finger. Put it right back there. Now go to Matthew. Very good. All right. Matthew, chapter number 8. Matthew, chapter number 8. Verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy. I'm in Matthew 8, 8. That thou shouldest come under my roof. Bear with me. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No! Not in Israel. That's deep. I have never seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. The Gentile got great faith. I ain't seen no faith like this in Israel. But this centurion, now he's got it. He's holding the faith, he's holding the faith thing down. Verse 11, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven. Now how are you going to sit down with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob? Except you sit in the place that they, through faith, were searching for. The same city. And when you get to the city, you find out that Father Abraham is sitting there. And by the same faith that he had... We dwell there with like precious faith. Yes, sir. Yes. Revelation 21, 11. 
having the glory of God. Her light, this city's light, was like unto a stone most precious, even like unto a jasper stone, clear as crystal. I'd love to read much more. But the scripture goes on and it talks about there being no night there. It goes on and it talks about how there's no weeping there. If you back up with me and go to verse number three of chapter 21. No, go to verse number one of 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Could this possibly be, thousands of years later, the angel of the end time, led by our chief apostle, showing, connecting through prophecy, prophetic vision, showing John the finding of the city that everybody looked for. Could it be that he is talking about the very same city that God told Isaiah that he was going to create? Could this be the same heavens? Could this be the new heavens and the new earth that God said, I'm going to create when he told the prophet with eagle eyes, tell him that I'm going to create new heavens and new earth. He goes on and says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had glory to God passed away and there was no more sea. I'm trying to finish. And I, John, saw the holy city, Amen. new Jeru, Salem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Something came out of heaven that God created. It was a city. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, yeah. is with certain men. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yes, brother. And he'll dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away yeah. all tears of oppression from their eyes. And there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former chaos and racism and divisions and walls. The former things are passed away. And then he sat on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. He goes on and says, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of, the life, uh, water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the, br the brother killers, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Everyone that attaches themselves to the system that is causing chaos in this world will go to hell. Amen. But there's a new creation, a city of love, a city where love dwells. A city where there is no racism. A city where people are allowed to be themselves. A city of no masks. A city of no false narratives. A city where people are free, they're a joy, and they're rejoicing. And when we get this vision, no wonder people sold their possessions. And invested in the city of God. The apostles are not bad businessmen. They have created a business that will gather everybody together and it's so good that God will take that business. I'm not trying to minimize the church. I know the church is not a quote unquote business, but we do handle business. 
that God will take that all the way to heaven. And we are unwise to not monetize such a city. I have an investment opportunity for you. Will you invest in a city, a, a whole city that's a joy? A whole city that's a rejoicing? That's a good investment. Well, how, how much do you need all of it? And with that, and with that lack of rejoicing, we will close. I thank you for your time. I love you with all my heart. Thank you for letting me preach so long. It's Saturday night. You didn't have nothing to do anyway. And I want to tell you that I love you all. I love everybody. I love myself. And I love you. And there's nothing that's going to make me divide from you. I'm going to hold on to you until the end of time. I got to tell you something else. There's nothing that's going to make us divide from our chief apostle. There is nothing in the world. They can talk about him, and if I may so say, Hargraves and Tinsman belong together in prophecy. Prophetically belong together. I love you, saints. Let's be the city that God said he would create. We are that. Thank Amen. you for your time. Thank you for letting me take so long. God bless you.